and good morning, and I hope that everyone is having a blessed start of their week. Uh, this is day uh, Monday. Uh, for those of you that are not yet hooked up on it, I'm starting to upload videos on Odyssey more, and hope to make that my go-to platform in the future as YouTube becomes more restrictive. Uh, let's start with prayer. Father, please edify these words that come from my mouth, that they are from your mind, and that the heart of the Holy Spirit speaks through me, and the Father's will is done by all that is in me. You should be glorified. Amen. So that will be uploaded on YouTube. Uh, aspiring, I think it's OO, left this comment. He was preaching against circumcision for salvation, not against obeying the commandment of God. And I've gone over this, that circumcision is a commandment of God. It's laid out repeatedly in Torah. It is placing confidence in the flesh, though. Uh, what places confidence in the flesh is disobeying Torah. And this is something that only a circumcised heart can see, and making it worthless. And then our works are menstruation rags. This is in the Bible. And I don't get frustrated very much anymore by the mercy of the Father changing me. But this comment from Christians across the spectrum, from those pursuing him through Torah, the, from those pursuing him without Torah, from those in the hyper-grace community to Calvinists, I've seen this so often, and it's so frustrating because it's such a perversion of the word. Your works are menstruation rags, says them. So why do you even bother to try to do what's right? And if you see this whenever you try to come against total lawlessness, like we should keep the Sabbath, well, why are you doing that? Your works are menstruation rags. Like, no, no, no. So let's talk about that. What do you mean works are menstruation rags? Well, it's in Isaiah 64. And it's a prayer for mercy and help, a prayer for the nation of Israel, which was sacrificing their children to the altars of Molech, burning them on fire. It's so wicked to believe that he's saying this of all people. And it's the same thing Paul does in Romans 3, taking passages of the godless and the lawless and equating that with all of mankind. A prayer for mercy of help. Oh, that you would rend the heavens, that thou would come down that the mountains might flow down at thy presence, as when the fire, as when the melting fire burneth, and the fire causes the waters to boil, to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. When thou didst terrible things which we looked not for, thou camest down, and the mountains flowed down to thy presence. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, neither have they seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waited for him. Thou meetest him that rejoiceth and worketh righteousness. And see, this is the verse right before their proof text for saying that everything they do is like filthy rags. But what does he say? You rejoice in those that work what's right. And Father, laid on my heart another verse I'm going to go to real quick, because this is such an important concept. And this is when Peter meets with Cornelius, uh, a righteous man. And I, and I want to go to that here, another passage here in a second, because Father found, helped me find another verse in Jeremiah about your filthy rags, about who you're talking about. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation, and nation is also the same word for Gentile in Hebrew, it's goyim, he that feareth him, and yes, we are to fear Father, and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. And this is something I fundamentally believe because it's so clear throughout Scripture. We are to work righteousness. And how do you define righteousness? It's not just doing what's right in your own eyes. The law of Christ, as Christians call it, it's laid out by Torah. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord 
our God as he hath commanded us. You see, it's, there's not a mystery in the Bible. It's so clear. And what does Isaiah say again? Thou meetest him that rejoices more than righteousness, like Cornelius. Cornelius was not a filthy rag sinner. Those that remember thee in thy ways, behold, thou art wroth, for we have sinned. See, these are people, and he's praying collectively for the nation, and we should as well. For we have sinned as a nation, killing babies daily, just like Israel was. And what do we do? Oh, oh it's for choice. And even those that are in the pro-life movement, they're like, well, what if we make exceptions for, uh, uh, you know, rape and incest and all this? Like, no, it's still murder. You're taking another person's life. And this is what the slaughter of innocents is as well. Those of you that still listen to my channel, they're Ebionites. The slaughter of innocents is not about animals. It's about children. In this continuance, and we shall be saved. You see, these are people that are not saved. They are in sin. And then he goes on into this verse that they use inappropriately. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. And we all do as a fade as, I'm sorry. We all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, which is lawlessness, wickedness, like the wind have taken us away. So this is a person that's caught up in their wickedness. It's not a saint following Yeshua. If you say, oh, all my righteousness is like filth and rags, you are going to end up in hell. There's no question about it. You can't go through life saying, well, I can't live righteously. All my righteousness is like filth and rags. Uh-uh. You're done. You're gone at the gates. You're not even going to get in. And there is none that calls upon thy name. You see, read the whole thing. If you're calling on the name of the Father and still in filthy rags, you're wickedly deceived. You're under a delusion that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. For thou hast hid thy face from us, hast consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, O Lord, thou art our Father, we are the clay, and thou art the potter. We are all the work of thy hands. Be not wroth, very clear, O Lord. Neither remember iniquity forever. Beheld, see we, beseech thee. We are all thy people. Thy holy cities are a wilderness. Zion is a wilderness. Jerusalem a desolation. Our holy and our beautiful house, where our fathers praise thee, is burned up with fire, and all our pleasant things are laid waste. Wilt thou Refrain. I just realized I need to transition this over so you can read it as well. But I'll continue. <laughs> That's funny. Thy, thy holy cities are wilderness. Thine is a wilderness. Truly, some of desolation. Our holy and our beautiful house, where our fathers praise thee, is burned up with fire, and all our pleasant things are laid waste. Wilt thou refrain thyself for these things, O Lord? Wilt thou hold thy peace and afflict us very sore? You see, this is a repentant prayer. Somebody who wants to live righteously. And we know Isaiah was a righteous man, so he's praying for the nation of Israel. Like, Father, you've laid waste to us because of our sin. And it's this person, this group of people that refuse to turn to the Father that have filthy rags. And we'll go through, and you'll see other characteristics of this person. Father, forgive that anyone, any Christian continues in this lie that, you know, all of my righteousness is like filthy rags. Oh, Father, no. Stop deceiving yourself, those of you who are saying this, as a defense to continue in lawlessness. So let's go to Jeremiah, the passage the Father just showed me. And this is related to a study I'm working on that's, I'm trying to figure out how to do it because it's going to end up being three hours, like my series on questioning Paul. Even your clothes are stained with the lifeblood of the poor who had not done anything wrong. You did not catch them breaking into your homes, yet in spite of all these things you have done, you say, I have not done anything wrong, so the Lord cannot really be angry with me anymore. 
And see, this is how Christians use grace. It's like, I'm under grace, not under the law. I have not committed any sin in his eyes. And then in the next voice, you say, all of our righteousness is like filthy rags. Oh, Father, please have mercy on them. So many of you are deceived. And this is why Jeremiah, he says the state of the Gentiles. And you really have to take this home. Then I said, Lord, you give me strength to protect me. You are the one who can run to for safety when I am in trouble. Nations or Gentiles from all over the earth will come to you and say, our ancestors had nothing but false gods, grace, worthless idols that could not help them at all. You have to realize you have inherited lies. If you believe that the Torah is abolished, and that you don't have to keep the Sabbath, you don't have to continue worrying about what to eat and what not to eat, then you're just like Eve and Adam in the garden. Eve was deceived first, and that's why I mentioned her first. That the serpent came to her and said, Did God surely say you shall not die? And this is the same lie you get in the pews. Everything I do and you do is like filthy rags. Hallelujah. Oh, Father, have mercy on them. And I pray, please, please, please listen to the words of the prophets and the Torah. Let's go to Jesus, the parable of the wedding feast. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. Again he sent out other servants tell those who were, saying, Tell those who were invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and fatted or calf are killed, and things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious. And he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. And this is the destruction of Jerusalem. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. And this is the going out to the nations. So the servant went out into the highways and gathered together all of whom he had found, both good and bad. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But the king came to see in. He saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. What did he have on? Filthy rags, because he refused to do what was right in the father's eyes. So he said, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to his servants, Bind him, hand and foot, take him away, cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. And yes, those of you who believe in once slaved, always slaved. Eternal insecurity. You are deceitfully wicked. For this person was a believer. You think unbelievers are going to even be at this wedding feast? Oh, you Believing a lie. Stop believing those who tell you things that are clearly not in Scripture. The person cast into outer darkness. Why do you think they're weeping and gnashing their teeth? It's because they were lied to. They didn't dig deep for the pearl of great price. And in my coming study, I'll talk about that as well because. Many of you have found that pearl, but you bury it. You don't share it. Revelation 19.7 Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor for him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. Yes, you, as the wife, have made yourself ready. His righteousness is not a blanket. And to her, she was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for that fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And you have to understand, that this means exactly what it means. If your righteousness is your covering, you best not be saying, I, I, my righteousness is filthy rags, because that's not what John's saying here. Saying, and you have to truly understand, 
All of Scripture matters. All of it. Even Paul's writings, which are from the enemy, it, it's laying out a picture. So let's go a little deeper here. What does John mean? Well, let's go to John's uh, epistle here. Whosoever committeth sin, transgresseth, transgresseth. Let's go to something a little easier to read this morning. All right. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. And this is crystal clear. One of the clearest passages in the whole Bible on what is sin. Sin is transgression of the law. It's not a substance. You don't get it from your father. And I'm going to go into the next passage where we dig a little deeper. Why would God see all of our righteousness that we're doing as filthy rags? Well, because sin is lawlessness. And if we're, as Jeremiah says, and this is related to uh, the parable of the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25, you know, what was the problem with the goats? They had done great sin to the poor. And therefore, that at? their clothes were covered in the blood of the poor. And this is really a powerful statement. What are your clothes covered in? Matters by your actions, not just what you think. See, whoever commits sin is committing a lawless deed. And sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And this doesn't mean mentally, again. This means action, that your sins are not being done. And in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. And Christianity teaches you this is a mental thing, that spiritually you're not sinning, even though in the flesh you are. And this is why they say all your righteousness is like filthy rags. They are being truthful, but you don't dig deeper see the deeper truths and I pray that those of you in the deception when we get to Ezekiel your mind is unlocked and your heart is opened you get on your knees and you weep to the father you say father I have sinned against heaven please take me back whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him I'm going to read that again whoever sins actively in the flesh or the spirit has neither seen him nor known him Little children, let no one deceive you. And this is what Yeshua, Jesus, warns as well. There are deceivers out there. There are those that have sown tares among the wheat. Why do you think Paul is in the Bible? He's in the canon because the tares have been sown among the weeds. And this happened immediately. He who practices, in the, in the Greek, this is active, doing, as James says, do not be deceived. Whoever is a hearer, and not a doer of Torah, and that's what the word is there, is a deceiver. He who practices righteousness or actively does it, and as we saw in Deuteronomy 6.25, what is righteousness? And it shall be our righteousness we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God. Our covering is doing Torah. There's no question about it. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins, and remember what sin is, sin is lawlessness, transgression of Torah. So he who breaks Torah, let's go back to verse 8 here. He who breaks Torah is of the devil. For the, Torah, for the devil is sin from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not break Torah. Let's read that again. Whoever has been born of God does not break Torah. For his seed remains in him, and he cannot break Torah, because he has been born of God. In this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not do righteousness, or whoever righteousness is doing Torah, is not of God. Nor is he who does not love his brother. Well, let's go into that, because there are many that say, well, I love my brother. Well, do you truly? Because well, they know that's laid out in a Torah commandment. Leviticus 19.17. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. How many of you knew that was a Torah commandment? It's right there. So whoever does not love his brother is breaking Torah as well. 
For this is the message you have heard from the beginning. That certainly is. It's right there in Torah. It's, it's not Yeshua making new commandments. It's been there since the beginning. So now let's go to Ezekiel to really hammer this home. Because I really want people to be freed from this deception that your deeds don't matter to the Father. And I want to go back to Cornelius as well uh, real quick. I lost that verse, though, so let's do a little search. Blood. Oh, that's right. It was a different chapter. I forgot about that. Your clothes are stained with blood. So let's look at how did Cornelius treat the poor? Because I'm telling you, this is so important to Torah, to, to making sure you're clothed in the righteousness of the Father. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian Regiment. A devout man, which means he was faithful to the Father, one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people. So he helped everyone he could. He feared God. He prayed to God always. You have to understand, it. God does care about what you do. He sees all we do and everything we say, everything we think, and everything we've done will come to stand the judgment. Where his mercy comes in through the Son is showing us the forgiveness and the mercy of the Father to overlook our prior iniquities. Cornelius was a very righteous man. And this is what the angel says. At about the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying, Cornelius. And when he observed, he was afraid. He said, what? What is it, Lord? He was filled with fear because it was an angel of the Lord. So he said to him, your prayers and your alms have come up to a memorial for God. And this was a sweet offering to the Father that he was praying constantly to God. He was always generous to the people. He feared God with all his household. And, and people say, well, all my righteousness is like filthy rags. Was that the case with Cornelius? No. He was a very righteous and devout man. Don't believe these liars. So now let's get into Ezekiel. And Father, I pray... Please open their eyes and their hearts and their ears. The word of the Father, Yehovah, came to me saying again, What do you mean when you use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are always set on the edge? As I live, says Father Elohim, you shall no longer use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine, the soul of the Father, as well, the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. So what do you remember what sin is? It's transgression of Torah. So the soul who breaks Torah shall die. And it's plain as day. That's what Torah tells us. But what does the mercy of the Father show us for the, those whose hearts are set on no longer breaking the law? But if a man is just and does what is lawful and right, like Cornelius like we just read. Your past, if your heart is set on turning from lawlessness, he will overlook that. And this is what we see. Let's continue. And if he has not eaten on the mountains, nor lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, nor defiled his neighbor's wife, nor approached a woman during her impurity, if he has not oppressed anyone, but has restored to the debtor his pledge. And yes, I do believe even under the mercy of the Father, you should restore that. He has robbed no one by violence, but has given his bread to the hungry, covered the naked with clothing. If he has not taken or exacted usury, and yes, those of you in banking, if you're a Christian, quote-unquote, you, you really need to take this to heart as well. I've turned down job offers from banks because of this verse and Torah commanding us not to exact usury. And I've also asked, like, what should I do about the money in the bank? I don't want to exact cursory from anyone. I don't want to be lawless in any way, nor exacted any increase, but has withdrawn his hand from iniquity and executed true judgment.
judgment between man and man. If he has walked in my statutes and kept my judgments faithfully, he is just. He shall surely live. And it's not just talking about this life, because we all will die until he comes to give us the resurrection of the just to eternal life. Says the Lord God, if he begets a son who is a robber or a shedder of blood, who does any of these things and does none of those duties, but he has eaten on the mountains or defiled his neighbor's wife, if he has oppressed the poor and the needy, robbed by violence, not restored the pledge, lifted his eyes to the idols or committed abomination, if he has exacted usury or taken increase, shall he then live? He shall not live. If he has done any of these abominations, he shall surely die. His blood shall be upon him. If, however, he begets a son who sees all the sins which his father has done and considers but does not do likewise, who has not eaten on the mountains, nor lifted his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, nor defiled his neighbor's wife, has not oppressed anyone, nor withheld a pledge, nor robbed by violence, but has given his bread to the hungry and covered the naked with clothing. And again, we see the same thing. We see in Cornelius and Jeremiah too. The covering of the naked and the poor is so important to the Father. But the, the church, the wicked church, takes your tithe, your increase, and uses it to go play rounds of golf and expensive luxury resorts. Who has withdrawn his hand from the poor and not received who is three or increase, but has executed my judgments and walked in my statutes. He shall not die for the iniquity of his father. He shall surely live. You see, this is also why what Paul says in Romans 5 is impossible. We don't pay for the sins of Adam if we turn from what he did to doing what's right. The soul that sins shall die. And he's not talking about the first death. As for his father, because he cruelly oppressed, robbed his brother by violence, and did what is not good among his people, behold, he shall die for his iniquity. And again, this is the second death. Let you say, why should the son not bear the guilt of the father? Which is what Paul tells us, that we all bear the guilt of Adam. Because the Son has done what is lawful and right, and has kept all my statutes and observed them, he shall surely live. Amen. If any of you turn right now from saying, Father, I was wrong about my deeds being filthy rags before you. I need to repent. I need to do what is right before your eyes. The soul who sins shall die. And the Son shall not bear the guilt of the Father, nor the Father built, bear the guilt of the Son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself. And what the Revelation says about our linen. Our linen is the righteousness of the saints. That's what it means about being upon yourself. That you will wear the clothing of your deeds. The wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. But if a wicked man, and this is the Father's mercy again, if a wicked man turns from all his sins which he has committed, keeps all my statutes, and does what is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. The same thing we see in Revelation. You shall not taste of the second death if a wicked man turns from his sins. If you take off the filthy rags, let the Father put the clean rags on you, the linen None of the transgressions which he has committed shall be remembered against him. Because of the righteousness which he has done, he shall live. Do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord God, and not that he should turn from his ways and live. But when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness, and this is where the filthy rags verse comes in, if you are a righteous man and turn back to your sin, you've lost salvation. You are not once slaved, always slaved. You are not eternally insecure. You have to turn from your sin. You have to remain on that path. You have to endure till the end. But when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity, and does according to all the abominations that the wicked man does, shall he live. 
all the righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered. Remember what Isaiah calls this? Filthy rags. That all your righteous deeds become like filthy rags because you have turned from your righteousness and done what is wrong in the Father's eyes. And this is the context of Isaiah's passage. He even says, we have sinned. Why would you just read one verse and form doctrine from it? Because of the unfaithfulness of which he is guilty and the sin which he has committed because of them, he shall die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not fair. Hear now, O Israel, is not my way which is fair and your ways which are not fair? When a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and dies in it, it is because of the iniquity which he has done that he dies. Again, when a wicked man turns away from the wickedness which he has committed and does what is lawful and right, he preserves himself alive because he considers and turns away from all the transgressions which he committed. He shall surely live. He shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says the way of the Lord is not fair. O house of Israel, it is not my ways which are fair, but your ways which are not fair. Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to his ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions. And remember what John says, transgression is a violation of Torah, so that the iniquity will not be your ruin. And this is the message Yeshua teaches. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Cast away from your heart all the transgressions, which you have committed, and get yourselves a new heart, a new spirit, for which you, why should you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says the Lord God. Therefore turn and live. Yes, I pray that each of you does the same. He doesn't have pleasure in the death of the wicked. He doesn't have pleasure. Even though you're deceived, you will die even though you let yourself be deceived. And this is why the scripture so often warns, test their words. Are they speaking for Jehovah? And this includes the words of Paul. When he says that circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing, is this a true statement? Test his words. Is it from God or is it from man? And that's what you should be asking yourself for all of these things you do with the pagan passage of Easter that just went by. And yes, it's glorious that he is risen, but he wasn't risen on that Sunday. He was risen on the day of first fruits, which happened well before that this year. And this year, the first fruits was the Sunday before Easter. So you got to ask yourself, what are you really worshiping? And I pray, Father God, open their eyes, open their ears, and let them have a heart that perceives. Father, let them not continue in their transgression of Torah. Let them not continue in their wicked, wicked, vile ways. For we have sinned. And this nation is so, so lawless, so filled with a lack of love, a lack of mercy. And I see, Father, even in my own life, times where I've not been patient, times where I've not been still to know that you are God, that you will take care of me, times where I don't completely trust you, but I trust in my own ways. I pray, Father, that you continue working on me, continue working with my heart, continue giving me eyes that are clear, a speech that is clear, and ears that are here. Thank you, Yeshua.